Hi, it's Dennis Daly. Many years ago, I interviewed Graham Kerr, the galloping gourmet, the Scottish-born chef who moved to New Zealand and then to Canada and in the 70s had the hottest cooking show on television. But I was happy to talk to him again because in the 80s, he had a near-fatal heart attack and he's changed his way of cooking. The first thing I wanted to tell him was how much better he looked than he had a year previous. A very good friend of mine, you know, with whom I have an enormous uh, good relationship, wrote to me the other day and said, I hear that you finally hit the brick road on the brick wall on the yellow brick road at 60 miles an hour. So from that I deduced a new world too, that I actually had to blow out 60 candles on the 22nd of January. Did you make it? I did. <laughs> oh, well, as a matter of fact, one of them came back to life again. It was really quite odd. And then I realized that, of course, this is actually that I'm 59, that I won't be 60 fully until, until next year. Well, a couple of weeks ago was Jack Benny's 100th birthday, had he been alive, and I was telling everyone it was actually his 61st, 39th birthday. <laughs> Let's go back uh, to a time before we knew about you as the Galloping Gourmet. You were in the military. You were born in England. Uh, how did you make that transition from military officer to, to running around uh, with a frying pan? Well, you have to know, first of all, that before the military, I mean, there are such things. You know, there is life before the military occasionally, uh, although what kind of a life is another matter. Um, I was in the hotel business. I was raised in the hotel business at the age of 10. My father took me into the kitchen and said to the chef, please do something with him, keep him out of the bar. You know, I was an only child, mm -hmm. and so that was the only place I had to play. So I, I began by playing in a kitchen. I, I don't think I've actually ever given it up, but um, that's where I began. In the military, my father said, who had been a major during the war, um, I think it would be, uh, he spoke very British, he said, I think it would be a fate worse than death, my boy, if you were to be in the Army Catering Corps. Well, of course, I just accepted that fathers were always right, and... Um, did the best that I could to avoid that. Well, I, now let, me, I was, let me back up here. That yeah. When you say Army Catering Corps, that sounds yeah. quintessentially British. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> would, would we call it the mess over here? <laughs> yeah, or, or the commissary okay. or whatever. Yeah. Yes, well, this is a, a core of people within the Army who are, do absolutely all of the uh, provisioning and uh, food cooking and all the rest of it and serving in the, uh, in the Army. So. Uh, it was to be avoided, in other words, and I really did try to avoid it, but um, as, as um, fate would have it, it eventually came and roosted on me, and I became an officer and, uh, and was um, finally found out and made a, a, what they call a specialist catering officer, and that job I did in the Army. Now, um, I left the Army and went back to the hotel business. And then right. along the way, in 55, you married your, your, your first wife, as some people say, your only wife, and she <laughs> yeah. was a, a film star there. Yes, um, you have to know that we met when we were 11 at school. I actually gave up soccer um, under her influence to begin with, and then I sold my MG to get married. And, you know, for an Englishman to be able to say that, uh, those are the two great privileges in a man's life <laughs> that you give up to be married. I guess we uh, can leap or gallop ahead enough to at least say, uh, without ruining the plot line here, that she has played a major role in your television oh, program. Oh, absolutely. In, in my life as a whole. In fact, both the old television and the new, she's an absolute key feature. In a, I, I looked back at it the other day, and when I thought that at 10, I went into the kitchen for the first time, and at 11, I met Trina. It meant that within a 12 month period of time, the two major pivotal things in my life actually came together, and that, that I've now had 50 years of experience with both. So it's kind of interesting, yes. And you haven't abandoned with, either, so. Yeah, right, exactly. Um, uh, both, both are still daily deadlines. <laughs> Move us ahead, if you will, then, to when most of us first discovered you as a, a dashing, suave fellow with a little, uh -huh. a little air of uh, bawdiness, uh, yes. just bursting yes. on the scene. A rather over-exuberant American by the name of Paul Talbot, actually he's a neat guy, uh, came down to Australia and saw what I was doing by that time it, the show had gone from New Zealand uh, just once or twice to New Zealand nationally and then to Australia nationally and was was one of the top rating programs uh, you know in that part of the world so he came down and he saw this and he thought to himself gee whiz you know maybe this would go in the United States 
So he made me an offer which I refused. Again, I've been refusing, you know, offers all my life. And he said we could do 650 shows. And I said, you're out of your mind. You know, I've never done more than 36 a year. It's impossible. Well, anyway, he lent and lent and lent on me. And I said, well, we'll do 65 and then we'll see how it goes. I'm sure that'll be enough. And um, I went to Canada. At the press review of the first series, which was done in Toronto in Canada, um, the press stood up and clapped it, um, just clapped a scream, which I, you know, gave everybody the idea that maybe 65 might not be enough. And that's what took place. So we did 485 shows in the end of that series, twice um, nominated for an Emmy Award for daytime television. And, um, and you know, for a food program, that's pretty unusual. <laughs> I, I had mentioned 71. Actually, that was the year that something rather tragic happened that brought that first series to a yeah. halt almost, yes, or, or hastened its demise. Yeah, well, as a matter of fact... And almost hastened your demise. Yeah, almost. I mean, it was... It, well, the squad car that went past us on the wreck of our, of our motorhome, which was rear-ended by a... A, a speeding vegetable truck, which my critics <laughs> thought was an excellent oh, choice. It terrible it, irony. Yeah, exactly. It, it was doing 75, and we were doing about 35, and in a foggy night on the US 101, it hit us. And um, 250 feet later, down, slewed down the ice plants in the middle of the meridian of the road, you know, we wound up a sort of uh, total wreck. And um, and the squad car that passed us en route to an emergency said, no point in stopping for that one, they must all be dead. Oh, good Lord. And um, uh, But they came back later and found we weren't. So um, Trina was badly hurt in that one from a psychological point of view. I was partially paralyzed on one side and, uh, you know, hey, um, I'm afraid from that point of view it was over. I mean, we, we, we could not continue. I tried to do some programs sitting down. Somebody who's listening now may remember them. They were called Critics' Choice, and mm -hmm. uh, it really didn't work at all. So after a few of those, we decided that that was it. And a wonderful doctor in Scotland who was examining me said, I, what you really need to do is to take a long ocean voyage on your own boat and pull some lines and catch your balance. He didn't sell boats by chance, did he? No, he didn't, <laughs> but he should have done. And I was thrilled to hear that because I've been a yachtsman all my life and I thought, well, that sounds just fine. Now, you sailed, it, it says here in the bio, more than 24,000 miles. Yep. Yes, we did. Well, you would have had yeah. to have had some experience previous then, as you yes. said. Oh, you were yeah. Experienced. I mean, yeah. Yeah, I used to sail a little 14 foot dinghy, you know. <laughs> and when they say, you know, the old sailors never die, they just get a little dinghy. <laughs> <laughs> and so Graham Kerr, the galloping gourmet, and his wife decided to sail around the world. They ended up in the Chesapeake Bay in Baltimore and bought a house. But by that time, they both had a lot of personal addictions alcohol and prescription medicine. A young woman went to work for them as a maid. She started taking them to church. They both converted. They've cleaned up their lives. And now Graham Kerr, the former Galloping Gourmet, has a second career. You're listening to Dennis Daly and American Montage. His life fell apart about 10 years ago. He went on an around-the-world cruise with his wife. They both had addictions to alcohol and prescription medicines. And then a young lady walked into their lives, a domestic, a maid, if you will, who started taking them down to the local church in Wilmington, Delaware. They both had a, a conversion, have straightened out their lives. And now Graham Kerr has a brand new series of programs. Graham, let me ask about that. First of all, how... Uh, how did you finally reach the point where you realized that the rich cooking you used to do on the old Galloping Gourmet show just was the kind of things that clog up the arteries and, and, and actually can kill people? And, and how did you, I guess it was a, a kind of conversion you had yourself to go from the old school of cooking to, uh, to the new school of cooking? Well, fine. Let me ask, uh, un answer that in the reverse order. Um, th it got my attention on the boat when we had a very rich dinner ashore went back on board and there was a storm and uh, I, got, um, I, I got to feel very seasick. I wasn't actually seasick, but so did everybody else on board. And we looked at each other and said, you know, we can't eat like that, like we ate last night and sit in a boat in a storm. It just is impossible. Maybe we've all been subclinically sick 
when we go to bed with a full stomach of rich food and we don't feel too good the next morning but hey you know we didn't we didn't feel seasick and um, and we would have done if we'd been on a boat so what we decided to do was to remove the fat and quite a bit of the salt the alcohol and things like that from our diet not altogether but really scaled it down and found a wonderful way to live so that was point number one point number two was that Trina had um, an interesting reaction to this eventually because I came when we came ashore I simplified it again and again and again looking for the ultimate simple uh, wonderful food you know um, and I forgot that food had to taste good and, um, and and look great I was just after what it would do to you and um, so she said in the end there's nothing left to eat and, and she rebelled and went back to bacon and cheese and sausage and everything else well seven years later she had a heart attack and a stroke there is really nothing quite so profound as someone you love having a problem and um, like that. So I remember sitting in the air ambulance and saying to myself, if she pulls through this, I'm going to take all of what I used to know about food in the aromas and its colors and textures and all the lovely stuff. And I'm going to bring that over and I'm going to mix it into what I now know about food, which is so very good for you. And I'm, in other words, I've lightened up, but now I'm going to brighten up. And um, so she did pull through, okay. And so I've been on this new track now for seven years. And um, and I must tell you that uh, that I now, oh dear, um, this is awful I have to say to you, Dennis, but I think perhaps I am now the, uh, the world leader in this field, just because I'm one of these 110% people, and, and I suppose because, you know, I've been a long time in the kitchen, 50 years, and, um, and of that, 30 years of that learning how to do it rich, and 20 years learning how to do it lighter. Well, you're certainly not doing it haphazardly. I mean, here you are going with the American Heart Association mm -hmm. using their research. The, the one thing I was going to ask is, for example, uh, for those, I might say, who have not seen your new show, it's called, uh, the, the program itself is what you call mini-maxing, which is, how, yeah. do you, how did yeah, you put that, that word together? Well, mini-max is, is two words. Um, you minimize risk because you care about the person for whom you're cooking. And I mean, that has to be mm -hmm. there. Otherwise, there's no point to you wanting to get involved in the first place. The second uh, issue is maximizing <coughs> the enjoyment of the eating process. And uh, that's what I had failed to do in the, in the first time when I went round on this one. So you shorten those two words, mini uh, for caring, max for pleasing, and you become a care pleaser or a minimaxer. Can you, you like. in the closing minutes here, without, um, you may have them in your head, and what I was going to say on the show is you will take a traditionally prepared dish and then show how to fix the equivalent and then compare That's statistically right. the difference. Give us a, a real, I'm thinking of fettuccino, fettuccine Alfredo or something, uh, an example of, of yeah, the okay. before and the after, if you will, and how, you, how much experimentation it took you to arrive at something that is just as palatable but won't kill you. Well, you know, the interesting thing is, Dennis, I call this search level one, search level two, and search level three, and whoever's listening to me at the present moment, may I just say to you, um, at search one, you just want to be healthier than you feel at the moment. But that's all. You know, d don't give me too many statistics, is what you'd say. Search level two is when you think that some member of your family is at risk, or you are personally, you've had a high cholesterol or high weight or whatever else the, the issue may be, maybe slightly diabetic. Now, it doesn't matter. You're, you feel at risk and you, you don't want to be. You want to pr practice prevention. That's number two. Number three is you really do have, like my wife Trina has, a real health problem and you are at high risk. That's such level three. Now, you don't have to be at any one of those levels um, to join. You can be at all three, if you like, or not feel that you're in, in any one of them. This is what I want to say, Dennis, on this issue. Um, an Alfredo um, uh, is 1,700 calories and has 130 grams of fat in it. Um, now, normally, a person needs about 50 grams of fat a day. That's if they happen to be at search level one. If they're practicing prevention, they need to go down to about 40. And if they're practicing a reversal because they're really ill, they need to go down to about 20 grams of fat a day, which is like two tablespoons full of, of, of fat from all sources, which means that you've really got to go virtually vegetarian with a little meat as a tiny garnish on the side. Now, the big thing that most people say to me is, oh, but I've got to give up so many things that I love. And I say, absolute rubbish. 
that the things, the salt, fat, and sugar, and large portions of meat that we need to reduce, not remove, must certainly go down. But look at all the aromas and colors and textures that you can have from herbs and spices and vegetables and fruits uh, and, and, and all the vinegars and everything all over the world that are suitable for enhancing that food. So all I do is I dial it back a couple of notches in risk in the salt, fat, sugar, and large portion of meat, and I dial it up in the aromas, colors, and textures. You know, there seems to be a hidden good thing here also. The most common thing you hear people say is, what am I going to cook tonight? I mean, I've cooked the same thing over <laughs> and over again. Isn't the excitement of searching and, and being a, a cook where you're looking through other people's recipes and buying books such as yourself, isn't, isn't that, in a way, a wonderful way to get out of your rut? Oh, um, if I tell you that the average woman in her lifetime, if she is average and at home, which doesn't make her average, of course, but, <laughs> you know, uh, there are 47,800 meals that she would prepare. Um, she's likely to only have 10 that she repeats frequently. That is boring. You're like I mean, my mother in pot roast. <laughs> okay, but it is delicious, isn't it? About and the first hundred times. Yeah, and you love it. Yes. Um, now, the big thing that all I say is I'm not asking you to throw away the pot roast, but just to dial it back a little bit and start putting some other things into it that you also like. Now, when you start doing that kind of thing, you are wide open. It isn't anymore a recipe. It's really a relationship to the food that you like and to the people that you love. Graham, I could ask you about a million questions, but we're running out of time. I guess okay. uh, let me ask you to redefine the name of the program, where we can see it, the, I'll, the, the latest book you have out, and then I have one final question for you. Okay. Well, if I redefine the latest book that I've got out is um, Creative Choices, and it's really just a simple question of what I've said there. It allows you, as an individual, to go through 98 different foods and check off the ones that you like, cross out the ones you don't like, and put a query against those that you don't have never eaten. And then think of dialing back a little bit of the amount of salt, fat, and sugar and the large portion of meat, and start moving these favorite foods of yours into that recipe. And, and uh, lo and behold, you become a creative, interesting cook yourself, and you change your own lifestyle. That's the only way I know that it can succeed in the long term. So that's, that's the first answer to it, and I forget the second. Oh, you had a final question for I me. had a final okay. question. What percentage of the people in the English-speaking world mispronounce your last name? <laughs> Um, almost everybody. Uh, there's Deborah Carr, um, Bill Kerr, the comedian, and Graham Kerr, me. Um, I'm a Scot, and the other two are English and Irish. And uh -huh. that's the reason, that's how we tell each other apart. But um, at the present moment, we're, we're, we're all getting on very well with each other. The, uh, well, some part of the Irish don't, but, um, but uh, there we are. We're doing okay. In the early days, we used to kill people who called us by that wrong pronunciation. <laughs> and with some of those recipes you had in the 60s, that was the case. Exactly. Yes, that was me getting my own back. <laughs> Graham Kerr, I want to thank you for taking the time to join us. I, I really enjoy watching your show. And for those of us who aren't 18 anymore and realize that we just can't digest as many Big Macs as we used to, mm -hmm. Uh, it's really wonderful uh, the, the way you analytically compare all the, the, the portions and all the, the component parts that go into food. I, I look forward to seeing your next program. Thank you. The next one is going to be um, uh, going to people like you who have uh, co communicated with me that they've been trying this new idea and have come up with some exciting ideas. What I've been doing in this next series is actually cooking their dishes. So it's like that. You can be famous for 15 minutes. You know? <laughs> so it's, um, I'm, I'm having a wonderful time cooking in other people's heads Graham. with other people's experiences. Graham, thank you for joining us. Bless you, Dennis. Graham Kerr, the galloping gourmet who has changed his way of cooking. I'm Dennis Davis.